Math 1314, hypothesis test, population proportion, testing the difference in two population proportions, critical value approach. I'm only going to do one example of testing the difference in two population proportions using the critical value approach because the flow of it is almost exactly like testing one population proportion using the critical value approach. There's only two places where we really have to make some minor changes. Number one is in the statement of the hypotheses, and number two is in the calculation of the test statistic. So let's read the problem and figure out how to do this. 30 out of 40 men surveyed plan to watch the Super Bowl. Well, right away we were given information to calculate a p hat value, a proportion of a sample. So let's go ahead and set that up. p hat, we'll say p hat m for men, is 30 out of 40 which is 75%. So there's one p-hat value. Next line, 21 out of 30 women survey plan to watch the Super Bowl. Well, that's also a, a sample of women, so we'll say p-hat w, and that's equal to 21 out of 30, which is exactly 70%, so we'll write 0 0.70. Hmm, the proportion of men seems to be greater than the proportion of women who plan to watch the Super Bowl. Seems to be. Can we conclude at a significant level of 10% that a higher proportion of men plan to watch the Super Bowl than women? So we're being given a hypothesis, but let's figure out which one it is. Can we conclude at 10% that a higher proportion of men, so that would be PM, remember we're trying to make a claim about a population, hence this has no hat, uh, a higher proportion of men, so that would be greater than the proportion of women. Would this be the null or the alternative? Well, seeing as it does not permit equality, it has to be the alternative. Our alternative hypothesis will be the proportion of men is greater than the proportion of women. And by the way, I know this is titled the difference in two population proportions, which implies a subtraction problem, and I wrote no subtraction problem here. However, if we subtracted the proportion of women from both sides, we would get the proportion of men minus the proportion of women is greater than zero. So we actually are testing the difference in these two population proportions, although it's not critical to rewrite this inequality in terms of a subtraction problem. But what about our null hypothesis? Nowhere in the statement of this, of this problem is a null hypothesis stated or implied. So what do we do? Well, I'll admit this is the first example where I haven't given you a null hypothesis, but I did state in an earlier video what to do in the absence of a clearly stated null hypothesis. Do you remember what it was? In the absence of a clearly stated null hypothesis, we use equals. So for our null hypothesis, we're going to use that the proportion of men equals the proportion of women or if you wanted to write it in the context of a subtraction problem, the proportion of men minus the proportion of women is equal to zero. All right. So either way, uh, whether we write the hypotheses in terms of one proportion on one side, one on the other, or the hypotheses in terms of the difference in proportions, uh, these would be good um, hypotheses for this situation. Left tail, right tail, or two tail? Greater than? This is going to be a right tail test. And remember, in the critical value approach, we use that information in step two, not in the p-value approach. All right, speaking of step two, determine the regions. Well, this is the same song you danced as before. Bell curve. Right tail test means right tail. Significance level is the area of the tail or tails. In this case, the area here is 10% as a decimal, 0 0.10, as a four-digit decimal, 0 0.1000. And then we can use our Z-chart to look up the Z. Now, remember that our Z-chart lists left tail areas. And so if we look up the right tail area, we will get the Z with the wrong sign. Plus, it should be evident being a right tail our Z is positive. If we look up 10%, which again, you would think I would have memorized by now. If we look up 10%, or rather, <coughs> excuse me, 
the area closest to it, if you're looking at your Z chart, look in the negative 1.2 row, go to the second to last column, and you'll see 0 0.1003. That is closest to 10%. And looking at the top of that column, our last digit is eight. The Z in the chart is negative 1.28. But this clearly can't be negative 1.28 because it's on the right side. It's positive 1.28 based on the symmetry of the bell curve. Label our regions, non-rejection region, rejection region. And on your test, I will specify to label the regions, meaning if you don't, points will be deducted. And step two is complete. Now we know the boundary that separates rejection from non-rejection. Step three is the other step where we have to make a change. Because step three, the calculation of the test statistic requires formulas to get what we want. Uh, the standard error is going to look a little funny. It is the square root of the sum of two fractions. The first denominator is n1, the second one is n2. And if you watch the video that the videos that I made for estimating the difference in two population proportions, you might think you know what's about to happen, except it's not. The numerator of both fractions are the same. It's p bar times 1 minus p bar on both, which immediately brings up the question, what the heck do you mean by p bar? Now, let me make sure that the textbook that I'm currently using does use the bar notation. I know exactly where to look. And granted, I'm not teaching this book relative to a specific, um, um, that I'm teaching this class without uh, being, granted, I'm teaching this class without being connected to a specific textbook. I, don't want to, I do want to be consistent with the book that I'm using as a frame of reference. And where did that go? Sorry, I meant to look this up before we started the video, but we've come this far, so there's no going back now. And they don't use a p-bar. Must have been in a different book I looked. Sorry about that. They use a p-hat. You know what? I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to use p-hat. I'm going to go back to using p-bar. And... In, in the off chance that there's somebody who knows more statistics than I, than I do, and they're looking at this and go, no, no, don't use p-bar here. Get over yourself. We all know that the notation and the emphasis in statistics is never the same, but I still haven't exactly explained what this p-bar is. So here's what p-bar is. You might think it's a mean because of a bar like x-bar, and it's kind of like that, but it's called the pooled proportion, pooled sample and the word pooled here, P-O-O-L-E-D, means that we pool everything together. Uh, the best way to think of this is to think of our two samples as one sample. In other words, instead of saying 30 out of 40 men and 21 out of 30 women, it's how many people out of how many people. Almost as if we were to erase the thing different, separating these two populations. In this case, don't look at it from a gender perspective. But if you must have a formula, it would look something like this for this case. The subscripts would change from problem to problem. It would be the total number of people who plan to watch the Super Bowl, which would be, um, actually, let's just put it together. The total number of people who plan to watch the Super Bowl is 30 and 21 out of 40 and 30 people total. In other words, Again, it's almost like we had 30 out of 40 men in a room, we had 21 out of 30 women in a room, but then suddenly we just lost sight of their gender and said, well, out of these 70 people, 51. Oh, why did I put a square root on that? Dang, I botched up this last part so much, it makes me want to stop and restart the video, but I'm already so far into it that I'm not gonna. And I don't mind making errors in videos. It shows you that everybody's human, doesn't matter how good you think you are. The pooled sample proportion is going to be what fraction of the whole, uh, excuse me, what fraction of the two samples pulled together. So out of the 40 plus 30 people surveyed, so out of the 70 people surveyed, 
30 plus 21 of them, or 51 of them, plan to watch the Super Bowl. So let's see what that proportion is. 51 divided by 70, <coughs> excuse me, to four decimal places is 0 0.7286. So that's all a pooled sample proportion is, is when you pull your two uh, samples from your two populations together and treat it like one big sample. All right, so we have a little bit more work to do to calculate the standard error because we have to calculate this pooled sample proportion. Uh, but other than that, well, the formula for actually calculating the test statistic will be just a little bit different. Let's go ahead and finish our calculation of the standard error. Our standard error is going to be the square root of this, 0 0.7286, times 1 minus that. This is going to be a wide fraction. Over the first sample size, and the first sample size was 40, log the square root, plus another fraction, same numerator, 0 0.7286, times 1 minus 0 0.7286, over the second sample size, which was the 30 women. And that is that is one of the messier things we're gonna to have to put in the calculator. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of algebraic shenanigans here. I would not bother trying to clean this up algebraically, I would just do it. But for the sake of time, and frankly because I know enough calculator chicanery that I can pull this off, I'm pretty sure that this is 0 0.1985, but you can tell in my voice that I wasn't 100% sure. So I'm going to do it one more time just to make sure. Okay, 72.86, 1 minus 72.86, and I got a totally different answer that time. This time I got 0 0.1074, so which one is it? Well, I don't know, let's try it a third time. And honestly, in big calculations like this, it is not that uncommon to make a, a, a keystroke error just because of the magnitude of the number of buttons you have to press. So it's not a bad idea to try putting it in twice and seeing if you get the same answer twice. And I got the second answer again. So I, I really thought that first answer was a little too large. But I got 0.1074 again. Double check that. Yes. So I'm going to assume that's the correct value to four decimal places. 0 0.1074. And if I'm wrong, so be it. I'm sure somebody will comment below. All right. So a lot more work to calculate the standard error and to calculate our test statistic. It's the same setup as before. What we got from our sample minus what we get from our, our hypothesis divided by the standard error but when you're comparing two proportions being equal to each other, then the difference will always be zero. So the second half of the subtraction problem would be zero, and all we really have to do is calculate the difference in the samples. In other words, the first sample proportion minus the second sample proportion divided by the standard error. Again, whatever the subscripts may be, and if you want to be generic, you can just say one and two. The proportion of men who are watching the Super Bowl is 75%, 0.75. The proportion of women who are watching the Super Bowl is 0 0.70, 70%. And our standard error was 0 0.1074. And so let's see what that is to two decimal places. The difference on top is 5% divided by the standard error. You get 0 0.4655 to four decimal places. So as you can tell, when we're testing the difference in two population proportions, the calculation of the test statistic, which is finally here, is a lot more involved. Not necessarily because of the size of the standard error formula, but even that is a little bit nauseating. But the fact that you have to calculate a pooled sample proportion, which really isn't that difficult, prior to calculating the standard error. Just remember, the pooled sample proportion is like you're taking your two samples as one big sample and ignoring what separates the two populations, in this case, gender. All right, so a lot to jump through, but there's our test statistic, and now we're ready to wrap this thing up.
The make the decision and answer the question moves are pretty much the same. Our decision, step four, is still based on where our test statistic lands relative to our critical value in this picture. Our test statistic is about 0 0.4655, which would land to the left of our critical value in the non-rejection region. Because we land in the non-rejection region, our decision, do not reject the null hypothesis, which means now we can answer our question. The question was, can we conclude that a higher proportion of men plan to watch the Super Bowl than women? So we did not reject the null hypothesis, so we're keeping it and rejecting the alternative. We're being asked, can we conclude the alternative? And the answer is no. So no. We cannot conclude a higher percentage of men watch the Super Bowl. By the way, these, these numbers were completely made up. It does, however, point out that just because your sample disagrees with your claim about the population, just because your sample disagrees with your null hypothesis doesn't mean we can reject the null hypothesis it's an issue of how much does it disagree with it. In this case, it didn't disagree with it enough for us to reject the null hypothesis. All right, we got one more video. We're going to look at the uh, testing the difference in two population proportions using the critical value approach. Uh, and then we'll do one more video after that just to wrap everything up in a nice little package.